Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nabila Abdenabi, and I am the RBC Curatorial Fellow at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. Uh, we are very pleased to be working with Art Toronto for the 10th year to present a series of three power talks during the fair. We'd like to extend our gratitude to Susanna Rosenstock and the Art Toronto team. The power plant, located at the Harbourfront Centre, just a few blocks south of here, is now in its 29th year of presenting contemporary art by Canadian and international artists, concentrating on emerging and mid-career artists who have often not yet had a solo show in Toronto or Canada. Just two weeks ago, we opened our fall 2016 exhibitions featuring the work of Ito Barada and Maria Laboda on view until January 2nd, 2017. We also opened a site-specific commission by Latifa Ishaksh on view through May 14th, 2017. To complement our exhibitions, we offer numerous education and public programs each season. I am pleased to inform everyone that the power plant is also participating in addition to Toronto Downstairs, featuring a selection of exhibition-related publications and exclusive limited edition artworks, all with reduced prices for members of the power plant. Today's power talk speaker is Fauz Kabra, and her talk is titled Rock the Kasbah. Fauz was. Oh. Sorry, just have that effect on mics. Um, Fauz was recently assistant curator at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation's Abu Dhabi project in New York. She has curated The Way Things Can Go for the Armory Show Focus in 2015 and has co-curated the Brick Biennial in Brooklyn in 2014. She was also the curator of Art Dubai Projects in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Fauz Kabra to the podium. Thank you. Okay, let me get myself situated. Let me send a picture to my mom. If you wanna wave, you can wave. Awesome, thank you very much. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, thank you, Nabila, for the introduction, and um, thank you, Josh Human, and the Power Plant um, for inviting me here and to Art Toronto. Um, and thank you to Timothy Chandler for getting me over here. Um, so, as uh, Nabila mentioned, my the title of my talk is uh, Rock the Caspa. Um, rock the Caspa by the punk rock band The Clash uh, was released in 1982 and was part of their album Combat Rock. Um, it is the band's highest charting single in the world um, and they were truly a socially and politically engaged band that sang about injustice, human rights and social decay, um, among other um, activist subjects. Uh, the storyline of the song, as you can see from the stills I have called from YouTube, um, depict two characters traveling throughout Texas, um, an Arab hitchhiker and a Hasidic Jewish limo driver. Um, they befriend one another on, uh, on the road as they head to a Clash concert. Um, they eat hamburgers at a Burger King together. Um, the Arab is uh, seen filling up gas at a petrol station. Um, well, we know where a lot of the world's petrol comes from. Um, all ironies that pop up throughout the video. Okay, so fast forward to 1991, um, and Rock the Casbah is the first song to be played by the Armed Forces Radio operation, um, uh, during Operation Desert Storm, also known as the Gulf War. Uh, which was in response to the Saddam Hussein-led invasion of Kuwait. Uh, the song was chosen by Armed Forces Radio to be the first song broadcast on the service covering the area during Operation Desert Storm. Um, and, of course, the band did not intend for this at all. They were singing about the complete opposite. And allegedly, Joe Strummer, who wrote the lyrics uh, to, the band, uh, to the song, uh, was brought to tears when he found out that the phrase Rock the Kasbah was written on an American bomb that was detonated on Iraq in 1991. So talk about cultural appropriation or cultural misappropriation, which is the adoption or use of the elements of one culture by members of another culture. So in this particular case, punk rock culture is stripped of its identity and intellectual property. Um, 
to think about that moment in 1990 when Kuwait was invaded, which later led to the Gulf Wars and the U.S. invasion of Iraq, is to also think about how the last three decades or so of the 20th century witnessed neo-colonial and neoliberal pressures on the area that culminated in these wars, which eventually led to the further dismantling and turbulence we are seeing today. So I'm giving you this quick historical background, um, not to bring everybody down, but to just kind of lay, uh, kind of lay the ground for what I'm going to present with these artworks. So, um, so what if we started looking at works from the 90s through the 2000s and till today? Um, what can we see when we look at them once again? What do we uncover or grasp with hindsight? The 90s feels like a long time ago already. The aesthetic and images are dated, and so much has happened since, the, um, since within the Arab world, but also globally. Also, we look at images, uh, also as we look at the images I've compiled of various artworks, we will see how these works reveal the conditions of art production in an area defined by a shared history of colonialism, the rise of pan-Arab solidarity, decolonization and social justice, to foreign and local military invasions, civil wars and radicalism, plunging oil prices, and growing neoliberal capitalism that brings city expansions and revitalizations. Um, so, Note of the Invasion is a lino-cut print by the Kuwaiti artist Tureya al Baqsami. Um, that she made in 1990. We can safely assume that this is the invasion of Kuwait that she's referring to. Um, here we see a man and a woman lament the Saddam Hussein-led invasion in the same year. Um, the artist kept making prints and paintings during this invasion, and in an interview, um, she admits that she would hide the works in the air conditioner when um, any Iraqi army would come by and visit. Uh, but she continued to paint in order to deal with the horror and depression um, that war brings. Uh, Janan al uh, made uh, shadow sites in 2010. Uh, she is from Kirkuk in Iraq, uh, Iraq uh, but lives in London. Um, in this video, she scans the remote landscape from a bird's eye view of southern Jordan. The territory is interesting as it sits um, in a critical position, sharing borders with Israel and occupied Palestine, as well as with Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Historically, the land where Jordan now sits has been a major trade crossroads and dividing line of empires at war. And so it is rich in ancient archaeology, archaeological sites. Um, in the film, we uh, witness uh, Nabatine and Roman sites, uh, World War I trench systems built by Ottoman troops under German orders, um, present-day roads, buildings, um, and agricultural developments. Okay, sorry, let me go back. So um, what is intriguing, though, is how the image moves uh, with the flying of this uh, plane surveying the terrain. So she created this with like a, a, a light um, aircraft, and then they custom built um, a kind of camera holder as they flew over this terrain. Um, so there is a beauty in the work, uh, even though it depicts images of contested land. Um, what the artist is also reminding us that uh, military technology provides advances in mainstream technology as well. Um, so I learned that it was the 1991 Gulf War uh, that was a turning point in uh, war reporting. Also, we constantly um, see a vacant land, therefore it is a land that is dehumanized and allows for an occupying force to take over. It's much easier to drop things. Um, so, Plan for Greater Baghdad by the Palestinian Kuwaiti artist um, Alat Yunus um, began with a set of images captured by the architect Rifat Chadarji in 1982 of a gymnasium in Baghdad that was designed by uh, Le Corbusier um, and named after Saddam Hussein. The project looks at monuments by architects for governments and the shifts and tensions between ideals and ideologies. Um, the Saddam Hussein Gymnasium was in, in, inaugurated in 1980, uh, 25 years in the making, as the commission for the gymnasium passed through five military coups, 
six heads of state, four master plans, each with its own town planner, a development board that became a ministry, and then a state commission, a modern star architect, Le Corbusier, um, among a constellation of many others uh, with their associated architects, draftsmen, contractors, agents and lawyers, and the list goes on. Um, so Alat Yunus's work is uh, based on archives, found material, and various stories that she's collected over the, over the years, and reveals the making of monuments for future generations, and is and is also an expression of power, ultimately. Um, but it also connects powerful people from around the world, such as Le Corbusier, um, in the sociopolitical narrative of Baghdad. Um, so, Northern Provinces, Tangier, um, is a work by Ito Barada, uh, who is now showing at the power plant, and I hope to go see that show right after this. Um, so this piece, uh, it's a photograph that depicts her home city of Tangier, uh, which she has captured since the late 90s. Um, in this photograph, Barada photographs a map that shows the Strait of Gibraltar, which is a strip of sea that separates the continent of Africa from the continent of Europe and the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. So, as you can see, this narrow strip of sea both separates and connects Morocco and Spain. Um, it allows for keeping bodies in or keeping them out, depending on which side you're looking at it from. Um, there's control, there's surveillance and boundaries, but there's also lived realities and exit routes. Starting, um, so all about Acapulco by Marwa Arsanios um, that she did through t 2010 to 2011. So she started this project with a chalet known as the Spaceship or Donut, uh, located on Beirut's southern beach coast, uh, which used to be called Acapulco Beach. Um, today, though, it is occupied by generations and generations of Palestinian refugees. Uh, the installation all about Acapulco brings together the different episodes in the life of Acapulco, a once very hip beach, uh, beach resort, uh, where we find the chalet that was uh, designed by um, uh, the architect uh, Raja Saab, a selection of the photographs, prints, newspapers, materials, and fragments of the videos. There's a total of 40 documents that she's collected, and she's recreated an architectural model of the chalet as well. So um, there is a trend that we're seeing here. These artists are producing works that do not necessarily display memories of a better past and the will to, to restore it. Um, it is uh, not nostalgic, nor is there ever a hero in any of the subject matter or images that we see. Um, artists are taking in a lot of personal history, socio-political history, um, and world history, uh, that they're really telling us, in the end, a very intriguing historical narrative. Um, and in the meantime, they're drawing attention to often overlooked um, cultural and historical narratives, you know, such as the case with Acapulco Beach. Um, and these artists are also working from an activist and sociopolitically informed point of view, uh, using ideas and concepts that stem from this personal history. And so the projects that we're seeing tell us something about the limits of representation, how history is produced, and how landscapes are transformed. And of course, at the same time, the works cannot help being a record of recent political turbulence, recalling dreams of social and cultural progress, offering a critique of political narratives, um, and exposing the effects or uh, absurdities of hypermodernization um, and addressing issues of migration. Um, so this piece by uh, Akram Zatari is um, uh, so. Uh, sorry, I'll backtrack. So Akram Zatari, he's a, is a Lebanese artist. Um, he grew up during the Lebanese Civil War, uh, where he lived in an environment of very limited mobility in the southern town of Saida. Uh, his practice developed as one of researching, collecting, and recording from his immediate surroundings. 
Um, his work straddles different genres from documentary filmmaking, photography, and archival practice. Um, in Nabi Hawada's uh, letters from family and friends, a piece that he made in 2007, Zatari explores Lebanon's post-war condition through these personal, through this specific personal history. Um, in this case, he looks into the communist resistant fighter, uh, Nabi Hawada, who at the age of 16 was detained in an Israeli prison from 1988 to 1998. Uh, the artist investigates the psychological effects of imprisonment and restricted communication through the series that consists of photographs of letters between Hawada and his family and friends during his imprisonment. Um, they're actually quite stunning, almost temple uh, photographs. You really feel like you could just uh, grab the pages. Um, uh, can't talk about the Lebanese Civil War without talking about Walid Rad. So, um, already been in a lake um, is uh, supposedly extracted from a notebook um, in the archives of a man by the name of Dr. Fakhouri. Uh, the notebook lists uh, the cars that have been used for bombs between 1975 and 1991 during the Civil War in Lebanon. Uh, what we see is a page of the notebook, uh, two pages actually, um, which contains an image of a car with the same make, model, and color as the exploded car, uh, with a text in Arabic that gives the details of the place, time and date of the explosion, uh, the number of people in the accident, the perimeter of destruction, the weight and type of explosive. Um, this is a, a time when Walid Rad was also working with the Atlas group, um, uh, this kind of fictional group. It, it was him. The Atlas group was him. And, uh, and he was also really working with the, these ideas of fact and fiction. Um, you know, they were a constant interplay. Uh, so looking at it, you think, you know, is Dr. Fakhouri real? Um, and we don't know. It could be. Um, so Muna Hatoum first became widely known in the mid-80s for a series of live actions and video works that focused with great intensity on the body. Uh, in the 90s, her work transformed to large-scale installations and sculptures. Um, Witness from 2009 is a miniature rendition in porcelain of the monument of the uh, Place des Martyrs in the center of Beirut. Um, Turned into an ornament, it nevertheless faithfully reproduces the monument's mutilation by the bullets and shells of the civil war uh, that it witnessed. So it's, it's a little funny. So she uh, reproduces this m monument made to martyrs um, as a uh, s smaller ornament, but uh, she includes its current state bullet written uh, from the civil war. So um, from statues commemorating martyrs as ornaments to the pyramids uh, as a regular backdrop in the Egyptian film industry, uh, Mahama Moon is interested in the visual representations of Cairo in domestic tourism too. Um, she uses films that have a scene with the pyramids as the backdrop. Uh, they're also used um, as a, a symbol of Egypt and she goes through the films um, from the 2000s to the 1990s, to the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, and then works her way back up again, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And, um, and so this video is, is, is all of these uh, various clips and all of these shots with the pyramids constantly in the background. Um, in this case, the video does not romanticize the past, uh, but in many of the films she selects, the pyramids stand as a symbol um, of Egypt, uh, acknowledging both its uh, glorious, but also its oppressive past. It references important moments in Egyptian history. So the pyramids are almost used as a projection screen for this contemporary national narrative. Um, Egyptian cinema is extremely popular in the Arab world. The country was the earliest in harnessing a prolific film industry um, in the region for several decades. I grew up on Egyptian television series and movies. Um, and that's how I can speak with an Egyptian dialect because of watching Egyptian movies. Um, 
So uh, sadly, though, in Kerim Lutfi's collages of torn film posters uh, from decades past, they show a kind of decay in the cinematic culture. Uh, we can imagine years of political oppression, nationalism, radicalism, uh, and political instability to have a major and tragic effect um, to this once abundant and inspiring industry. Uh, okay, so Lawrence Abu Hamdan, uh, he is a Jordanian uh, British artist who studies uh, the politics of sound. His PhD in research into forensics uh, has led him to even work with Amnesty International uh, to inter interview the foreign, uh, former prisoners of an SM, uh, excuse me, Assad regime uh, Syrian prison, um, where they were able to reconstruct what this prison looked uh, like simply through the stories that these prisoners would tell um, as they lived in a pitch black environment but they you know through um, Abu Hamdan's questions and their answers and uh, they're able to tell you about you know the schedule um, the distances between uh, cells and so on and really reconstruct this prison so um, he's also just won the Namjoon Pike award so he's a really brilliant artist whose work uh, comes into social practices and and actually helping people. It's wonderful. Um, so to address the problem of noise pollution in Cairo, Abu Hamdan made uh, the All Hearing, where he worked with two sheikhs, uh, imams of a mosque, to deliver sermons on the subject of noise pollution to the locals coming for prayer time um, and those that could hear the sermon through the speakers and the minarets. Uh, the imams preach through the microphones and into the speakers, warning against exposure to too much noise. Um, as uh, it is a contamination of the urban environment, they pontificate, um, and I quote, we seem unable to control our voices to say anything but empty words. However, we begin to see the irony here. Uh, the imams use the loudspeakers to broadcast their sermons on the topic of noise. And as you can imagine, it's quite noisy. And if you've ever been in an Arab country on Friday, it's, you know, everybody's doing it at the same time. And there are a lot of mosques going about it. So, um, so in this case, he worked with these two imams that, and he convinced them to talk about noise pollution um, as opposed to what the state suggested they should talk about for that Friday. So um, all the while in this video, a uh, shabby song, uh, shabby is sort of like a turbo folk uh, music, um, is edited as it is edited into the video um, and is a song about peace and quiet. <laughs> So what comes out as slightly perplexing and what one can take from it is the trouble of sound being mediated, which we can also understand as censorship, um, before it is distributed to the populace, which is a task traditionally taken over by the clergy in autocratic regimes, but also by the mainstream media in democracy. Um, and this brings us back to the present moment uh, with the uh, familiar scene from the Egyptian revolution and protests um, at Tahrir Square uh, that started in January 2011. Um, here the artist who also uh, depicted himself as part of the crowd, um, he is the last person there with his arms crossed, um, uh, also shows the, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, I lost my place. Uh, this haunting scene of the police dragging um, a woman and their violent action ends up exposing her undergarments. Um, and what anyone with a TV around the world uh, will remember um, as the woman with the blue bra. So if you were watching the protests on Tahrir Square, um, I remember seeing that and just, uh, I don't know, being surprised that I saw her blue bra, and it's, uh, it just stuck in my mind. Um, apparently, though, I mean, she kind of withdrew after that. She didn't want to have any interviews or uh, talk about it at all. Um, and 
here Ali uh, Sheri produces uh, these two works about the Arab Spring. Um, so I carry my flame um, and La Grande Vide uh, statue Assad. Um, so obviously uh, this is uh, such a strong uh, image that it's very hard to talk about, but it is, um, it is the image of Mohamed Bouazizi, the Tunisian um, uh, fruit and vegetable vendor who set himself on fire um, and also ignited the Arab Spring across Tunisia and several um, other Arab countries. Uh, he was frustrated. He got slapped in the face by a policewoman because he didn't pay some, uh, he didn't pay something because, uh, for his vegetable cart. So uh, he went to protest and nobody wanted to listen to him and out of pure frustration, he just set himself on fire. It's quite tragic. Um, and then you have the image of this empty plinth um, that used to hold a, a, a statue of Assad. Um, so this is quite, uh, you know, uh, it's almost like a, a one-liner, but it, it really just, re it's, it references back to what it references back to. It's just about that. Um, but it's also about, you know, what we can't talk about. Uh, what is almost impossible to talk about or impossible to uh, reimagine or recreate through anything else. Khaldun uh, Shishkeli is a Syrian artist born in 1944 who studied at the Fine Arts University in Damascus. Um, and he, from last I heard, he still lives in Syria. Um, and up until 2011, Shishkeli was a prolific artist who devoted himself to drawing 12 hours a day, every single day. Um, this diminished through, though, as tensions in Syria began in a full-blown and tragic war erupted. Um, but here in Shishkeli's uh, drawings, it's a set of um, 100 ink drawings. Um, his endeavor is quite simple, uh, but it's yet poetic and thoughtful. Uh, so through this series, um, he highly uh, uh, elaborates through ink drawings and aims to bring back these vendors of the past, um, as the title explains. And with Wanderers by Jumana Manna, uh, we cannot help but think about the migrants, um, the refugees, and the wanderers that are being refused from one border to another and constantly dehumanized. Um, but in talking with the artists and also doing further research, uh, the artist um, refers back to actually a moment when, when something like this actually had to be constructed. Um, and uh, uh, so she uses this sleeping bag for four people and she uses uh, military felt blankets. Um, and I suppose it, it really points to this idea of bodily, bodies uh, huddling together, uh, survival tactics and temporary dwellings. So we can see here that the artists have used the body as both sight and reflections of experience, displaying uh, narratives of biopolitics, the appearance and disappearance of the body, and places of construction and destruction. So the artists here use the sight of the body as a metaphor, taking control of their own representation and making works that critique political authority and ideology that consequently frame a socio-political uh, landscape in flux. So there is a trend that uh, can be seen where a, um, uh, as though of one's own particular visual language is emerging, which um, as this writer Elizabeth Susan Kassab poses in her book, uh, Contemporary Arab Thought, Cultural Critique in Comparative Perspective from 2010, she writes, um, it implies uh, the search for ways of defining such a thought as well as the need to link ideas to concrete local realities and histories. Um, the works also look at social, cultural and political history to inform an uncertain present, uh, revealing an aesthetic immersed in images and symbols derived from 
uh, turbulent sociopolitical narratives and popular culture of the Arab world. And so allow us to imagine that the body, um, what the body and uh, the community could look like. So through, the, through their works, the artists have revised official narratives and created works that have the potential to produce another knowledge that critically refers to these particular uh, sociopolitical realities. Um, looking at uh, these works that have engaged with these ideas of uh, resistance and popular culture, uh, queer identities also become visible. Um, here, Farah Al Qasimi, um, her work Gulf. Uh, she was she's a young artist. Uh, she was born in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and she's currently pursuing her MFA at Yale University. Um, she is young but very uh, active. Uh, she, uh, she's also a uh, punk rock uh, musician who has formed her own band and plays a lot in Brooklyn. So uh, she photographs obsessively, and much of her work before Yale uh, looks at commodities, status, gender, relationships, and money. So she takes pictures of the banal and day-to-day, um, -day capturing things that are familiar and foreign at the same time. Uh, the images become somewhat strange. Um, the photograph uh, here is from a project titled The World is Sinking. Um, and as the title explains, there is a landfill being covered uh, with plants, and these plants come in plastic barrels that might have stored oil, uh, with the word gulf appearing on this repurposed barrel. Sorry, I'm just going to a sip of water. Mohammed Qasim uh, is an artist from the United Arab Emirates. Um, he started early on making paintings and then began working with ideas of mapping. Uh, through performance and actions that he documented, he explored various methods of mapping and interacting with his immediate environment and the objects that surrounded him. Uh, Qasim has written in the past, it is through inexactness that I want to reach another dimension, enabling me to coexist with my objects. Uh, these two pictures from his series, Tongue, uh, from 1996, also reveal such actions. Um, Kazim sticks his tongue into domestic objects, like a thermos or a keyhole, and ends up achieving a weird and perverse unification uh, with these inanimate objects that we can assume he uses regularly. Yeah. <laughs> and you can imagine the rest, if you'd like. Um, in this video, uh, I would have loved to show you all the videos, but we would have been here for much longer than an hour. But um, in this video, uh, uh, Class A by the Qatari American artist uh, Sophia Maria, an actress uh, who Al Maria worked with uh, during auditions, is depicted. Um, the story goes that uh, this actress uh, is a famous television personality, and she is jailed for one year uh, because, according to the artist, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, she was accused of smuggling drugs, and used as a scapegoat. Um, so this is kind of an homage to this woman. Um, and. Uh, El Maria uses the footage from uh, the audition uh, for a film that unfortunately never came about, but it ended up being an art exhibition instead. Uh, she uses the aud audition tapes along with footage, found footage of a um, interview that ends up being quite, you know, harsh and aggressive uh, with this other female journalist that's kind of drilling her about things. Um, so in this collage by Lara Baladi, uh, titled Perfumes and Bazaar, the Gardens of Allah, the artist inquires into the notion of paradise. Uh, she borrows her title from a, a kitschy perfume shop in Cairo uh, by the same name and begins to weave a dizzying combination um, of personal history, um, apparently the woman to the right uh, is the artist's mother, um, 
Uh, so she weaves this personal history with elements she has found from popular culture, um, popular visual culture, and what is considered to be uh, luxurious and decadent, as we can see this like gold frame and this antique furniture and so on, um, kind of reminds me of my grandmother's apartment in Damascus. Um, so another work uh, by Akram Zatari um, is this piece uh, titled Her and Him, which she did from 2001 to 2011. Um, it is an experimental documentary and portrait of a su studio photographer, Van Leo, uh, who's there. Um, Van Leo had a studio throughout the 40s, 50s, and up to the 90s in Cairo uh, before he passed away. Um, through his hundreds of self-portraits um, and portraits of everyday people and celebrities, as well as visitors to Egypt, one can begin to trace a cultural and social history in the city, but also the larger area. Um, going, you know, if you Google Van Leo, you'll find hundreds of photographs that he's taken, and a lot of them are actually of um, much, much, much younger, uh, not famous yet uh, Egyptian actors. And uh, it's quite amazing to see, uh, for example, there's this woman, her name is Shetty Han. Uh, if you were a kid growing up in the 80s and the 90s, you would have seen her beautiful long hair. She could sing and dance and act and a uh, really talented woman. And he was taking pictures of her as a young, um, you know, 10-year-old po posing in different um, uh, costumes. Um, but also at the same time, you see uh, portraits of, uh, you know, military personnel that have come in, um, the, the uh, um, actor, um, sorry, foreign pe foreigners that are traveling through. So there is a really rich uh, cultural history, but also political history of Egypt that's coming about through these photographs. So in any case, here though, in, uh, Zatari shows uh, photography as craft. Uh, the transformations of the medium of photography and the terminologies. And as I mentioned, evokes the social, urban, and political transformation that took place uh, in Egypt's recent history. So here's another one. And I love this one where it's Czechoslovakia because that does not exist anymore. It's the, so it's, and, and, and what's interesting is that when he's being uh, interviewed by the artist, you know, he's a very, very old man at this point, and he's saying about how he has to order this material from Czechoslovakia, and um, he was the best at retouching and really believed in uh, black and white photography. So the sense of self and the searching of what this self can be um, makes me recall uh, a set of questions uh, that also, again, um, Elizabeth Susan Kassab poses in her book that I mentioned earlier, Contemporary Arab Thought. Um, so thinking about what I have presented so far, she writes, and I quote, the quest for an affirmative sense of self has proven to be arduous. Um, it has involved a sustained effort at intellectual and cultural decolonization under adverse conditions of economic underdevelopment, political subjugation, intellectual confusion, and psychological pain. And it has led to the following questions. How is one to regain dignity and pride without falling into self-glorification? How is one to recover from self-hatred and overcome despair? What does it mean to have a culture of one's own and a thought of one's own? What is the link between having an identity of one's own and having a philosophy of one's own? How does one establish such an identity of philosoph or philosophy? What are the pitfalls and temptations of cultural authenticity and cultural essentialism? How does one reappropriate one's own history after it has been told and made by others? How does one recuperate one's own legacy after it has been denigrated and abused by others? How can one recreate a living relationship with one's history and heritage after one has been estranged from them by colonial alienation? Which history? Which heritage? Who is to decide and on what basis? 
how our history and heritage to be revived when modernization seems to be the urgent need of the day? What does critique entail in the post-colonial situation? How does the gendering of critique contribute to the search of or an empowering sense of cultural self? And finally, how does one affirm oneself and exercise critique at the same time? So that was a very long list of questions, but um, I couldn't uh, help it. I just wanted to share it all with you because it's quite powerful and beautiful. And um, it really made me think about uh, these artworks and it really made me see them. In, uh, uh, I was already seeing them in such a way. She was just providing uh, the language for it. And it's kind of an example of allowing the art to drive the theory. Um, so these questions translate to the questions that these artists are posing themselves and the types of critiques and discourse uh, they're generating. So in his film, My Father Looks for an Honest City from 2010, uh, we can see the overwhelming effects of hypermodernization as we observe a landscape um, of abandoned constructions in an arid and uh, lifeless environment, you could say. Uh, the man in the film, is actually Megdi's father, um, and he is searching for something that is never sp specified or made clear. Uh, the backdrop of this unfinished vision of growth can be looked at as failed aspirations, uh, but at the same time, one can't help uh, thinking about the current um, extension of urban development in the area, um, and specifically in Egypt. And sorry, when I say area, I'm assuming you all understand I'm here because we're talking about art from the Arab world, so that's the area. Um, so uh, when I look at this work again, um, I remember the announcement of a couple of weeks ago of how China's rebuilding a new Cairo, a new downtown, a new capital. So it's, it's quite shocking. And then you go back and look at this video, which you can access from the artist's website. All of his work is online. All of his videos are online. Um, and look at this again with this new set of eyes. Um, I, he wouldn't say that this is about what I'm talking about, obviously, but I'm the curator. I don't need to. <laughs> um, so uh, it is as though these developments you know, aim to erase any past and begin a fresh, clean slate, uh, leaving us in a state of doubt and uncertainty. Uh, there's already a lot of bids happening to rebuild Aleppo uh, as we speak. So you know, this is kind of the case. Um, it was also the case uh, with the, after the Lebanese civil war of let's remove it, let's erase it, and let's rebuild. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but anyhow, um, so the works range from research-based, conceptual, and experimental documentary to using strategies of conceptual art um, to reflect on the socio-political. And uh, these artworks, uh, many of which date back to 1990, um, like I said, allow us to re-look at these pieces with hindsight. Uh, some even almost feel dated um, already. Um, and though the 90s wasn't that long ago, I would at least like to think so. Um, so in other words, it's uh, experiencing them again from our current point of view informs the present and cultural political moment and the landscape that we are experiencing. The appropriation uh, of images, uh, narratives, and histories asks us to question notions of representation, uh, history making, but also the making of meaning and how this expands out of various artistic strategies uh, used among these artists from uh, the Arab world and its diasporas. Um, so what I have shared with you uh, today is research based on a collaboration um, that I'm currently doing with the Bergil Art Foundation based in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates, and the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College in New York. And um, the, all the images that I've showed you are from the Bergil Art Foundation's collection um, that they've kindly allowed me to share. Um, so that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
I, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Tim has a microphone. I'm also around if you want to talk to me later. If you don't feel like asking me a question here, it's also totally fine. You, you okay. mentioned yeah. Um, yeah. Aleppo and uh, re, you know pending reconstruction, and um, I suppose the situation would be quite different. The situation would be quite. Oh, yeah. Closer. Okay. Uh, Apparently, it works uh, better. But now. what you said about Aleppo and the mm -hmm. pending reconstruction, and um, you're dealing with a slightly different, um, you know, uh, threat factors. You know, post post the immediate conflict in terms of buried, you know, IEDs and so forth. It'd be mm -hmm. quite different from what you had mentioned earlier about, was it Lebanon? Yeah, so not the same types of weapons, therefore, you know, any sort of reconstruction is gonna be a whole, much more difficult than it sounds. Oh, I'm sure. You know, I just decided I'd throw that in. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, uh, you know, warfare just keeps changing, but it's kind of also the same, um, you know, the same kind of techniques of warfare, but the equipment is a lot more modern, I'm sure. Yeah, I, but, um, yeah. but yeah, in any case, uh, these kinds of revitalizations, the, I, the idea of it is that, it's that idea of let's, you know, now that it's totally destroyed, there is a lot of money to be made and a lot of bidding of different architects and city planners. Of course. <laughs> was excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there was uh, a, a question right here. Thank you. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about your research and how um, the work that we saw, mm -hmm. uh, how it would be available to, uh, to people to see in, in America or up in Canada. Right. Um, well, uh, the the this research hopefully will culminate in an exhibition um, that'll show at the Center for Curatorial Studies next June. Um, it'll be announced. Um, I just announced a little bit, but <laughs> it'll be announced um, with with more information. But and this is research that I I guess I've been doing for the past five years, and I've been trying to uh, find ways of articulating this to um, uh, I. For me, I learn a lot about where I come from through these artists' work. And I've been trying to figure out how does one create an exhibition, how does one talk about these works through this lens, but also uh, pre representing them in the correct way. Uh, not saying that this is about this, but allowing an opening up of what else it could be. How else can it inform us, even if it's something that's made in the 90s? How, what is it telling us about today? Um, and I mean, the 90s is, is a big deal because it's, you know, the you know, neo-colonial, neoliberal pressures that kind of brought on these Gulf Wars, and we are now really seeing the results of this. So uh, for me, that's also what I'm seeing in the work. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this kind of... Um, S something's being told to me, and I'm learning these things from these pieces, from these photographs, from these videos. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I guess in a way, I'm also experimenting by talking to you all about it. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi. Oh, uh, powerful work. Thank you. And um, I'm wondering about the where you're able to make your ex exhibitions in the Middle East. Like, where is there uptake on this kind of a statement and where isn't there? Or have you, have you got a sense of that? Um, uh, do you mean to ask, um, just to make sure I understand you, like what are the different institutions or, or if there are institutions well, in the Middle East? That more so the different countries, like you mentioned that you were from, Ab or you'd been to Abu Dhabi mm -hmm. and worked there. So I'm wondering, it's a pretty conservative, I would imagine, art environment in Abu Dhabi, but I'm interested in what, you know, what, what is, has uptake and where in mm -hmm. the Middle East? Well, I would say um, in, I mean, I would, 
I wouldn't use the the word uh, conservative um, because that could be applied to Canada, to the U.S. You know, uh, the mayor Giuliani shut down a Chris O'Feely show at the Brooklyn Museum a few years ago uh, because of poop and the Virgin Mary being in the same place. So you know, we it it it's it's all uh, kind of. So it's hard for me to say that, the, to use that word, but um, I would say that uh, these locations definitely cater to their community and to their audiences. Um, and they're also building new audiences. Uh, they are also very international places, such as Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Sharjah. Um, they're kind of a, in, in that in the country alone, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, there are amazing initiatives that are happening uh, with the Sharjah Biennial or the Sharjah Art Foundation. Um, but then also uh, leaving the UAE uh, to Lebanon, there's a lot of uh, grassroots initiatives. Um, however, unfortunately, these grassroots initiatives do not get any funding. So uh, you'll have a, a project space that is struggling to keep their tiny little space alive um, because there isn't a single grant that they could apply to. But yet there's all of these uh, private foundations turning into museums um, near shopping malls and so on that are also opening up. So it's kind of, you have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that bucking up against each other. Um, so I'm not, I, I hope I kind of answered you in a way, but there's, there's a lot that's, that's going on and a lot of it is also in service um, of the community that's there. Um, and uh, there is definitely, there are places where the art, where artists are coming together and, and producing some amazing work. Um, most of these artists that I've uh, presented today, a lot of them live in Beirut. Um, some are living in Abu Dhabi, some uh, in Dubai, um, and others have had to leave and now live in London or the US and so on. Oh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And my question is, where we can see those artists? Who is possible to see in New York, let's say? Are they represented in New York somewhere? Yeah, they're, they're represented in various um, galleries. I, I think this uh, kind of excitement over the Middle East has been happening for the past few years. Uh, you know, like when Nabila first announced uh, introduced me, uh, I was invited to do a symposium on the Middle East, North Africa, and Mediterranean, um, which, you know, uh, you know, last year. So uh, there is definitely this, like, excitement about this really, really large region that is multicultural, different dialects, different, you know, even languages in a way. I mean, sometimes <laughs> we can't uh, understand one another. You know, if I were to speak with somebody from, you know, Morocco, it would uh, <laughs> be diff difficult. But, um, but so sorry, I went on a tangent. But yes, you could definitely find them in uh, some, you know, Chelsea galleries and so on. Um, you know, Munahatum, Walidrad, so on. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I'm not. I mean, I went to the Aga Khan today. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Yes, I saw that. I love that exhibition. It's beautiful. Okay. okay.